The Chrysalids, Chapter 5 Nobody at Wachnuck seemed to trouble about me if I was out of sight. It was only when I hung around that they thought of jobs that needed doing. The season was a good one, sunny, yet well watered, so that even the farmers had little to complain of other than the pressure to catch up with the farm work that the invasion from the fringes had interrupted. Except among the sheep, the average of offences among the spring births had also been quite unusually low. <clears throat> the impending crops were so perfect that the inspector had posted only a single field belonging to my uncle, Angus Morton, that needed to be burned. Even among the vegetables, there was very little deviation, and the sunflowers, as usual, provided most of what deviations there were. All in all, our harvest season looked like we were going to set a purity record, and complaints were so few that even my father was pleased enough to announce guardedly in one of his speeches that Wachnuck would seem to be giving the forces of evil quite a battle that year. And it was a matter for thanksgiving that retribution for the importation of the great horses had been visited upon their owner, Uncle Angus, and not upon the whole community. With everyone so busy, I was able to sneak away early, and during those long summer days, Sophie and I roamed more widely than before, though we did our adventuring with caution, and kept it to little-used paths in order to avoid encounters. Sophie's upbringing had given her a nervousness towards strangers that was now nearly an instinct. Almost before one was visible, she would vanish noiselessly. The only adult she had made friends with was Corky, the man who looked after the steam engine. Everyone else was dangerous. But we discovered a place further up the stream where there were banks of shingle-like rock, and I liked to take off my shoes, roll up my trousers, and paddle around, examining the pools and waterfalls. Sophie used to sit on one of the large flat stones that laid above the water and would watch me wistfully. Later, we once went there armed with two small nets that Mrs. Wender had made for us and a jar for our catch. I waited about fishing for the little shrimp-like crayfish that lived there while Sophie tried to scoop them up by reaching from the bank. She did not do very well at it and after a time she gave up and sat watching me enviously. Then, greatly daring, she pulled off a shoe and looked at her naked foot reflectively. After a minute, she pulled off the other one. She rolled her cotton trousers above her knees and stepped into the stream. She stood there for a thoughtful moment, looking down through the water at her foot on the washed pebbles, and I called to her, Come over this way, there's lots of them over here. And she waded through the water towards me, laughing and excited. And when we'd had enough, we sat on the flat rock, letting our feet dry in the sun. They're not horrible, are they? She said, looking at her feet. They're not horrible at all. They make mine look all knobbly, I told her. And she was pleased to hear that. A few days later, we went there again. We stood the jar on the flat stone beside our shoes while we fished. And we industriously scampered back to it now and again with our catch oblivious of everything, until a voice called out, Hello there, David. And I looked up. I was aware of Sophie standing rigidly right behind me. The boy who had called stood on the bank, just above the rock, where our things were laying. I knew him. His name was Alan. He was the son of John Irvin, the local blacksmith. He was about two years older than I was, and I kept calm. <clears throat> oh, hello, Alan, I said and I waded to the rock and picked up Sophie's shoes. Catch! I called as I tossed them to her. One of them she caught, but the other fell into the water, and she retrieved it. What are you doing? Alan asked. I told him we were catching crayfish. As I said it, I stepped casually out of the water onto the rock. I had never really cared much for what I knew of Alan at the best of times, and he was by no means welcome now. They're no good. Fish is what you want to go after he said. But then he turned his attention to Sophie, who was wading to the bank, her shoes in her hand, a few yards further up. Who's she? he inquired. I delayed answering while I put on my shoes. Sophie had disappeared into the bushes now. Who is she? he repeated. She's not one of... But he stopped, suddenly, 
and I looked up and saw that he was staring down at something beside me on the rock. I turned quickly. On the flat stone was a footprint that had not yet dried. Sophie had rested her foot there as she had bent over to tip her catch from her net into the jar. The mark was still damp enough to show the print of all six toes very clearly. And so I kicked over the jar, and a cascade of water and struggling shrimps poured down the rock, obliterating, obliterating the footprint. But I knew with a sickly feeling that the harm had been done. Uh-huh, said Alan, and there was a gleam in his eye that I did not like. Who is she? he demanded again. She's a friend of mine, I told him. What's her name? But I didn't answer. Huh, I'll find out anyway, he said with a grin. It's no business of yours, I told him. He took no notice of me. He had turned and was standing, staring along the bank, to the point where Sophie had disappeared into the bushes. So I ran up the stones and flung myself upon him. He was bigger than I was, but I took him by surprise, and we went down together in a whirl of arms and legs. All I knew of fighting was what I had learned from a few scuffles. I simply lashed out and did my furious best. My intention was only to gain a few moments for Sophie to get her shoes on and hide. And if she had a little start, he would never be able to find her, as I knew from experience playing hide-and-go-seek with her. But then he recovered from the first surprise and got in a couple of punches on my face, which made me forget about Sophie and sent me at it, tooth and nail, just to save my own hide. We rolled back and forth on a patch of grass, and I kept on hitting and struggling furiously. But his weight and size started to make a difference. He began to feel more sure of himself, and I, more weak. However, I had gained something. I had stopped him from going after Sophie right away. Gradually, he got the upper hand, and presently, he was sitting on top of me, punching me as I squirmed. I kicked and struggled, but there was nothing I could do except raise my arm to protect my face. But then suddenly, there was a yelp of anguish, and the blows ceased. He flopped down on top of me. I pushed him off and sat up to see Sophie standing there with a large, rough stone in her hand. I hit him, she said proudly, and with a touch of wonderment. Do you think he's dead? Hit him, she certainly had. He lay white-faced and still, with blood trickling down his cheek. But he was breathing all right, so he certainly wasn't dead. Oh, dear, said Sophie and dropped the stone. We looked at Alan, and then stared at each other. Both of us, I think, had the impulse to do something to help him, but we were afraid. No one must ever know. No one, Mrs. Wender had said, so intensely, and now this boy did know. It terrified us. I got up, and I reached for Sophie's hand and pulled her away. Come on, I said urgently. John Wender listened carefully and patiently while we told him all about it. You're quite sure he saw you. It wasn't simply that he was curious because Sophie was a stranger, he asked. No, I said. He saw her footprint, and that's why he wanted to catch her. He nodded slowly. I see, he said. But I was surprised how calmly he said it. He looked steadily at our faces. Sophie's eyes were huge, with a mixture of alarm and excitement. Mine were red-rimmed, with dirty smears trailing from them. He turned his head and met his wife's gaze steadily. I'm afraid the time has come, my dear. This is it, he said. Oh, Johnny, Mrs. Wender's face was pale and distressed. I'm sorry, Marty, but it is, you know. We knew it had to come sooner or later. Thank God it happened while I'm home. How long will it take us to get ready, do you think? Not long, Johnny. I've kept things nearly ready always. Well, good. Let's get busy then. He got up and went around the table to her. He put his arms around his wife and bent down to kiss her. Tears stood in her eyes. Oh, Johnny, dear, why are you so sweet to me when all I've brought you is... He stopped her with another kiss. They looked steadily into one another's eyes for a moment, and then without a word, they both turned to look at Sophie. Mrs. Wender became her usual self again. She went briskly to a cupboard, took out some food, and put it on the table. Wash first, you filthy things, she told us. Then eat this up, every bit of it. While I washed, I put the question I had wanted to ask often before. Mrs. Wender, if it's just Sophie's toes, couldn't you have cut them off when she was a little baby? 
I don't expect it would have hurt so much then, and, and nobody would have known. Well, there would have been scars, David, and when people saw them, they'd know why. Now hurry up and eat your supper, she told me, and then went busily off into the next room. We're going away, Sophie told me, through a mouthful of pie. Going away? I repeated blankly. She nodded. Mommy said we'd have to go if anybody ever found out. We nearly went away when you first saw them. But... You mean right away? And you're never coming back? I said in dismay. Yes, I think so. I had been hungry, but I had suddenly lost my appetite. I sat fiddling with the food on my plate, and the sounds of bustling and bumping elsewhere in the home took on an ominous quality. I looked across the table at Sophie. In my throat, there was a lump that I couldn't swallow. Where are you going? I asked unhappily. I don't know. A long way, though she told me. We sat there. Sophie prattled on between her mouthfuls. I still found it hard to swallow because of the lump. Everything was abruptly bleak all the way to the horizon and beyond. Nothing I knew was ever going to be quite the same again. The desolation of what was happening engulfed me. I had to struggle hard to keep back my tears. Mrs. Wender brought in a series of packs and bags and I watched glumly as she dumped them close to the door and went away again. Mr. Wender came in from outside and collected them. Mrs. Wender reappeared and took Sophie away into the other room. The next time Mr. Wender came from, for some more of the packs, I followed him out. The two horses, Spot and Sandy, were standing there patiently with some bundles already strapped to them. I was surprised not to see the cart and said so. John Wender just shook his head. A cart keeps you stuck to the tracks, but with pack horses you can go wherever you like, he told me, and I watched him strapping bundles on while I gathered my courage. Mr. Wender, I said, please, can't I come with you too? He stopped what he was doing and turned to look at me, and we stared at each other for a long moment. Then slowly, regretfully, he shook his head. He must have seen the tears that were close behind my eyes, for he put his hand on my shoulder and let it rest there. Come along inside, Davy, he said, leading the way back into the house. Mrs. Wender was in the living room, standing in the middle of the floor and looking around, as if for something she may have forgotten. He wants to come with us, Marty, said Mr. Wender. She sat down on a stool and held her arms out to me, and I went to her, unable to speak, and peering over my head, she said, Oh, Johnny, that awful father of his, I'm terrified for him. Close to her like that, I could catch her thoughts. They came fast, but they were easier to understand than words. I knew how she felt, how she genuinely wished that I could go with them, how she leapt on without examining the reasons to knowing I simply could not and must not go with them. I had the complete answer from her before John Wender had put the first sentence of his reply into ordinary words. I know, Marty, but it's Sophie I'm afraid for. And you, if, if we were to be caught, we'd be charged with kidnapping as well as concealment. If they take Sophie, nothing could make things worse for me, Johnny. But it's not just that, dear. Once they're satisfied that we have left the district, well, we'll be the next district's responsibility, and they'll probably not worry about us much. But if David Storm were to come with us, Joseph Storm were to lose his boy, there'd be hue and cry for miles around, and I doubt whether we'd ever have a chance of getting clear of here. They'd have posses out everywhere looking for us. We can't afford to increase the risk to Sophie, can we? Mrs. Wender fell silent for a few moments. I could feel her fitting the reasons into what she had known already. Presently, her arms tightened around me. You do understand that, don't you, David? Your father would be so angry if you came with us that we'd have much less chance of getting Sophie away safely. I want you to come. But for Sophie's sake, we can't do it. Please be brave about it, David. You're her only friend, and you can help her by being brave. You will, won't you? Her words were simply a clumsy repetition of her thoughts. Her thoughts had been much clearer, and I had already had to accept the inevitable decision. I could not trust myself to speak. I nodded dumbly and let her hold me to her in a way my own mother had never done.